Rick Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Henderson. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I start by thanking and congratulating my honourable friend for Sleaford and North Highcombe for bringing this incredibly important debate to many counties around the country that have been uh, mentioned so far, not least Buckinghamshire, since I was elected in 2019, the threat of large-scale solar developments has caused significant concern uh, for me and my constituents across my Buckingham constituency. Field after field and farm after farm have already been blanketed by solar panels to the detriment of the surrounding communities, food security, nature, and our beautiful landscape. And whilst we must strive towards a more sustainable and secure energy strategy, this does not and cannot include the huge sacrifice of agricultural land we have already made and many plan to make in pursuit of that lofty goal. Within the 335 square miles of rural Buckinghamshire that I am lucky enough to represent, a total of 3,600 acres of land has been either allocated to or planned for solar farms. That is one and a half times larger than the entirety of Heathrow Airport. The largest proposed industrial solar installation alone, Rosefield, uh, that is, sits amongst the villages known as the Claydons, dwarfs, dwarfs the size of the nearby town of Buckingham, a town of over 10,000 residents. It is not an exaggeration to say that the Buckinghamshire countryside is slowly being consumed by solar panels. And does this benefit anybody locally? No, it does not. Not when we consider the construction impact, the visual impact, the risk to wildlife, the risk to the local economy, our tourism economy. Buckinghamshire is lucky enough to have stunning, beautiful countryside that people come to walk through and then spend their money in our cafes and bars and hotels and campsites. <coughs> I'm not sure that they will still want to do that if the landscape is just covered in the glass and metal and plastic that these solar farms have. Not, of course, that the promoters of such schemes, such as Rosefield and the Claydons, Callies near Alswick, Borton in Buckingham, Redburn in Len Led uh, Ledburn, many, many others I could mention, not that those developers care about any of those points. And does it benefit our country? No, not when our food security is at grave risk of being severely compromised, as my honourable friend for Sleaford and North Highcombe has already outlined, through the enormous loss of agricultural land, that when taken together, when taken cumulatively, each of these developments represents. No matter how big or small, all agricultural land repurposed is not only food lost, but also livelihoods lost. Land which would have been farmed for generations beforehand, too often by tenant farmers, who are given no choice but to leave without any meaningful say in the process, or indeed any compensation. <coughs> to achieve the set target of 70 gigawatts from solar installations by 2035, more than 300... Before we leave, support tenant farmers. I will gladly give way to uh, my honourable friend. My honourable friend is making a brilliant speech and a very good point on tenant farmers. It's not one of the problems. The way we have set up the pricing of these mechanisms is it renders tenant farmers completely uneconomic. Mm. And so if you are some foreign investor with vast uh, investments in the British countryside, it's in your interest to throw them out uh, in, in, in favour of this policy. Uh, as ever, my rightable friend uh, hits the nail precisely on the head, and the risk to tenant farmers through the, the pricing mechanisms that we're seeing, through the, the sheer plain economics of it, uh, is severely stacked uh, against their interests. And actually, when you look at the volume of farms in this country that are tenanted rather than owned, if we, the more of the tenant farms we lose, the, 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 the greater the slide in uh, domestic food security we will see, and the current number of around 60% of self-sufficiency uh, will drop very rapidly uh, indeed. So my rightable friend uh, is absolutely right in what he says. Now, to achieve the set target of the, the 70 gigawatts from solar installation by 2035, more than 300,000 acres across the country would be required 
uh, for solar installations. And it's no secret that the rural economy, under pressure, for example, from rising input prices and many other things, has already faced significant challenges in recent years. Left with no viable options, some have been forced to sell their land or leave their land, and in the process, guaranteeing that it will almost certainly never return to food-producing status. Yet across all of those estates, all those farms, all that land, the barn roofs are empty and blank. Now, smaller standalone solar is less impactful, quicker and easier to install, does not risk damaging the local infrastructure, and provides additional reliable source of income for struggling farms. I'm in no way saying that farmers with maybe 10, 20, 30 acres of unproductive land shouldn't be able, uh, in consultation with their local planning authority and local communities, be able uh, to utilise uh, some of that land that, that isn't useful for producing food anymore for small scholar. That they should be able to put it uh, on uh, their rooftops. But the fundamental uh, point that I really want to make is that no amount of solar is actually going to revive the fortunes of some of those farms uh, that are indeed struggling. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Time and time again, I hear the baseless argument, and it's a point that has been developed already in this debate, from developers that anything less than grade 3A land should be given over because they believe it now to be incapable of growing any meaningful food. And I fundamentally disagree with that point. Grade 3B land can, in fact, be very productive. And I know that because the bulk of my constituency that sits in the Vale of Aylesbury sits on blue clay. And that means the vast majority of it gets a grade 3B land rating. But it remains perfectly capable in many, many cases, having been nurtured and loved and looked after for generations, perfectly capable of producing 10 tonne a hectare wheat harvests, which actually many farmers I know in other parts of the country on grade 2 land, maybe even grade 1 land, would bite, would bite your right hand off to get that sort uh, of yield at harvest time. I would... Mr. Griffin, I also have to be very, be very generous with his time. Um, he makes an extremely important point about this definition of grade 3 and grade 3B. Most people who know anything about the countryside know that one field may well be half 3A and half 3B. Mm. I'm told that Natural England do not have a map. They don't even have a clear definition as to what is 3A and 3B. But would not agree with me that the worst outrage of all is that when these speculative solar farm developers come along, it is their surveyor, they mm. pay the surveyor, who decides on the quality of the land. Hardly surprisingly they find a favourite of all being 3B. My right honourable friend uh, is absolutely right on that point. It's almost as if he uh, had been looking over my shoulder and seeing what was on the next page of my speech, because it is a point uh, that I am precisely coming to, because it is clear that the overpaid surveyors, the so-called uh, experts who, who come in with a very clear mandate of what it is they have to do, uh, have, hired, uh, have been hired to test soil quality they don't even go out into the middle of the field. They don't go out into the most versatile part of the farm where you know, the crop actually grows uh, because we have caught them red-handed uh, in Buckinghamshire testing the headland, testing the very edge of the field. And you are always going to get a lower score from that test if you haven't gone to the bit of the field where the crop actually grows. Yet they are deliberately testing the edge of fields. They are deliberately testing the, headline, the headland to get that poorer quality result. And because it wouldn't be a speech from me without mentioning this, it is the same tactic that HS2's contractors use uh, in, other, uh, in, in, in other parts of, of uh, my constituency to get similar <coughs> results to prove similar points. It is not something that is unique to the solar developers. I, I would be delighted. The, um, uh, the uh, land results proposed by the surveyors and the maps that DEFRA produce of what they expect the land to be and notice the differences. Uh, my, my honourable friend make, makes a very powerful point. Yes, time and time again you see a differential between uh, what the developer's own surveyor, what the developer's own consultant uh, comes up with and what we believe the land to be. I, I preface that a little bit with the, the comment I made uh, for, for much of my constituency sitting on that blue clay base that we do expect a lot of it to be 3B. However, I come back to the point that I made that 3B land actually can be very productive land and very good land producing the sort of yields 
uh, that I talked about. It is how that land has been farmed, often for generations, that dictates how good it is for food production uh, and not uh, other things. Now, 60% of farms uh, in the UK, a, a point I made earlier, are indeed uh, tenant farms. But beyond that, it's not just the farmers, it's not just the tenants, it's not just uh, those that are employed in those farms that hurt when that, that land is taken away from food production. The packing plants, the equipment suppliers, the distributors, a huge part of our rural economy and national economy is hit when food production is diminished. And for the surrounding communities, the loss of farmland by no means starts or ends with the solar panels. Take the Claydons, for example, where my constituents have suffered hugely from large-scale construction already, including a number of big housing estates, East-West Rail, uh, the ultimate destroyer, HS2. It is a daily struggle for them getting to work, school, the hospital, the GPs, or the shops, uh, without coming up against the obstacles of endless road closures, <coughs> broken stretches of road which have become dangerous after thousands of HGV movements, drivers travelling to and from nearby compounds and severe light pollution during the winter months. And that will be all the same all over again with the construction of these huge solar farms. 2,100 acres of solar farm is not built overnight. They are all put on concrete bases. There will be piling in places. That construction impact is considerable on local uh, communities. And so after all the disruption my constituents have already taken and are taking from those big national infrastructure projects, this once quiet corner of Buckinghamshire is now expected to take, in the case of Rosefield, a 2,100 acre development, actually dwarfing the amount of land High Speed 2 has taken in Buckinghamshire. So it's not unreasonable to expect that given the extent of the proposed site, we would see yet more of the same disruption that has plagued the Claydons for years. And all of this comes without any commitment by the promoters to fix any of the damaged roads, which are already having to uh, be patched by the council, even though when other people have broken them, it is simply not fair for my constituents and areas like the Claydons to foot all that pain all over again. And it's not just the panels which consume vast amounts of countryside. The infrastructure needed to carry the electricity generated uh, through to the grid swallows up yet more. And it is no coincidence that adjacent to the proposed Rosefield site, there's a proposed battery storage facility, equivalent of 90 shipping containers of battery storage right next door. More food-producing land being sacrificed, and the facility itself poses a major fire risk in an area where the emergency services are already struggling in the face of such disruptive amounts of construction work to get to any emergencies that occur. So let that be a warning, Mr. Henderson, to any community where solar is coming. It doesn't just end up in the solar panels. And of course, there is no community benefit whatsoever from solar development, whether large or small. No cheap electricity, as has already been said, for local residents or businesses. No support systems in place for those impacted by construction. No recourse for anybody affected. I've spoken a lot about Rosefield, and I just want to briefly talk about uh, some other uh, large-scale solar developments in my constituency. In the south of my constituency, we've seen an equally blatant tactic of yeah, admittedly slightly smaller scale, but still significant ground-based solar installations uh, being installed or proposed just metres from each other. Take the proposed solar installation near the village of Kimblewick on the eastern side of the village of Ford, or Callie's solar farm on the western side of the village of Ford, which combined would actually be the second largest land take in my constituency uh, after Rosefield for these ground-mounted panels. This is a tactic we have seen time and time again, which puts community and local authority resources under strain, in turn diminishing their influence over the whole planning process. We have got to find a way to ensure the cumulative impact of solar farms are taken into account. I'm very grateful to him giving way, and my apologies, I wasn't able to be here at the beginning of the debate. I was speaking in the chamber, and hence will not 
participate as a full speech, but would be very grateful to be able to make a comment. And he describes exactly the situation that my constituents in Roundhill face themselves with multiple applications uh, being made for adjoining pieces of land, all of which are small scale and therefore to be decided by the local district council rather than to be decided by the Secretary of State. They feel that this is um, an abusive way of applying, for, uh, 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 putting in solar farms, which will in cumulatively be a very large development. Would he agree with me that perhaps the government needs to, to have a pause on um, all applications of this variety being granted and uh, urge district councils to have the appropriate training that they need so that they can identify and fully measure the cumulative impact of these developments. I'm grateful to my writable friend uh, for that intervention. I do agree with her. I think there should be this uh, fundamental pause on any solar application being able to take uh, land used in food production. Uh, as the new uh, national planning and policy framework uh, was being negotiated concurrent to the levelling up and regeneration bill now act, uh, I was pleased to be able to persuade uh, the Secretary of State uh, for DLUC to uh, change some of the language in the NPPF from the old language of best and most versatile to, and it was hidden in a footnote, but it is still there, to a straightforward definition of land used in food production. And so if we can leverage that as the test that planning authorities now do have through the NPPF, coupled with the very sensible points uh, my rightable friend just made of, 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 a, of a going up in the helicopter and doing a review uh, of all land being taken and, and pausing any decisions. I think that would bring a lot of relief to communities, certainly mine in Buckinghamshire, and I'm sure hers in Staffordshire, and many others uh, as well. Solar does have its place, but that place is on rooftops and not fields. Across my constituency, our farms and industrial sites where the roofs of barns and warehouses are devoid of solar panels. My constituency adjoins uh, both Bicester to, to the Oxfordshire side and Milton Keynes uh, to the northeast. Many, many thousands of rooftops of distribution centres and warehouses and these big sheds that are going up as logistics hubs everywhere, you know, vibrantly adding to our economic uh, development, but with no solar on the roof. If we just got the solar panels on those roofs instead, mm -hmm. I think we would actually find we would have more than enough space to ensure that we are indeed uh, delivering on the volume of solar and uh, generated energy that we need. Uh, research from CPRE has found that there is a potential for 117 gigawatts of renewable energy to be generated from rooftops and other existing developed spaces in England alone substantially more than the, the, the master target. So rooftop solar systems have, have to be uh, the priority for government. And I would urge uh, my honourable friend, the minister, when he replies, to find a way of ensuring that our solar strategy is a rooftop strategy and not an agricultural land strategy. My honourable friend, for, and I will conclude in one or two moments, Mr Henderson, I'm aware of the time I've taken. My honourable friend... Uh, as she opened this speech, uh, her, uh, this debate, uh, made the point about small modular reactors. She even quoted a statistic I have used in the past, and it is one that I think actually goes to the absolute nub of this debate. This, the, the absolute uh, clearest argument I can make about what is a sensible land use strategy. And that is this point, that the small modular reactors we have seen companies like Rolls-Royce develop need virtually no land to deliver significantly more power. I, my honourable friend was kind to quote me earlier, but I will repeat the statistic because I'm quite fond of it. 2,000 acres of solar panels to produce on current usage, before everyone's got two Teslas on the drive, but on current usage, 50,000 homes worth of electricity. A small modular reactor, two football pitches, one million homes powered from the back of that. That surely has to be the more sensible use of land in this country, where we can power people's homes, we can power people's businesses, we can do so in that clean and wonderful way that nuclear can deliver, while still having national food security. Those numbers must surely speak volumes to anybody that cares about both energy security and about food security in our wonderful country. So, my clear asks, uh, as I conclude, 
we simply must diversify our national energy security strategy to promote less land intensive schemes that come at the expense of our food security, promote the development of other more reliable, sustainable and less impactful schemes we can actually deliver every day of the year. Secondly, put in practice the provision that I spoke about a few moments ago of the new language in the NPPF and encourage local authorities to actually use it. And three, incentivize the use of existing rooftop space for standalone solar installations on sites which already have a grid connection and to reform the grid to ensure many more can as well. So Mr. Henderson, let's get this right. Stop the solar destruction. Build our energy security on nuclear, protect our food security, and save the great British countryside. Yeah, yeah.